grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Good afternoon. We are gathered to celebrate the life of William Carroll Plasterer and to worship the God that he knew, loved, and served for a lifetime. As we share together in these moments this afternoon, I would like to just begin with a couple of words of uh, introduction and greeting. I am Wayne Heberlig. I am a nephew of Bill. At the organ is another nephew, uh, the Reverend Dr. Bradley Zell. Uh, at the helm helping me today is Dr. Fran Norton, a longtime, many, many, 50-year-plus friend of the plasterers. And uh, we'll be hearing, in our eulogy time, we'll be hearing from uh, the generations going down from uh, the sons to the grandchildren as well. We look forward to these moments as we remember Bill's life and as we gather together in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, who is our Savior, our Lord, and our soon-coming King. I would like to begin by sharing together in a passage of Scripture from John chapter 14. Jesus is with his disciples on the night that he was betrayed, and as he is sharing with them, he says these words to them, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me let us pray lord we thank you for your word and we thank you for this time together may your grace fill our hearts and lives to overflowing in these moments as we celebrate bill's life and as we celebrate your great love for us through christ our lord amen our hymn is number 77 how great thou art i invite you to stand with me if you are able as we share in lifting up the name of our lord
great God. And we thank you that you have wrapped your arms of love and grace around our hearts in these days, that you fill us with the fullness of your presence, and that you challenge us in our journey and walk with you, that we might serve you, that we might love you, that we might respond to you even in the midst of grief and loss and pain. We thank you, O Lord, for these moments together. In the name of Jesus and the whole family of God said, Amen. You may be seated. The service as it has been put together was actually designed by the family. The hymns that are sung are those that they have chosen and so is the way the eulogy is being shared today. But I would like to express my appreciation to the fine folks of Messiah Church for their generosity in opening the church for this service today of a longtime member. And also I'd like to express my appreciation to Reverend Bob Bistham who is the pastor here at Messiah Church for allowing me to share in this service in this way from this pulpit. I call on Fran now to share with us from Psalm chapter 91. Let us listen to the words of the psalmist. You who live in the shelter of the Most High, who abide in the shadow of the Almighty, will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night nor the error of the air that flies by day or the pestilence that stalks in darkness or the destruction that wastes us at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your refuge, the most high your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, no scourge come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they shall bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder and the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Those who love me, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they call to me, I will answer them. I will be th with them in trouble. I will rescue them and honor them. With, lo with long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. Did you hear? Carol and Carrie had a boy. Yes, they're naming him William Carroll. That's the word that spread quickly to the family and friends of Carol and Carrie Placerer in and around Chippensburg on July 6, 1935, and the days just after. Bill, as everyone called him, or Uncle Bill, as a good many of us gathered here would call him, was the oldest of four siblings. He had a brother, Gary, and sisters, Retha and Olive Jane. He would grow up on East Garfield Street here in Chippensburg and be educated in this, this school district. He also received a great education from his parents, learning the value of hard work, of loving and valuing family and friends, and learning to know and love the Lord. Bill had a job working at Chrysler's Produce and Grocery Store. Two brothers, Gerald and Melvin Kreider, were friends of Bill's and co-workers with him. Their sister, Doris Kreider, sat with Arlene Morrow as they rode the school bus to and from Chambersburg High School each day. One day, Doris told Arlene that Bill Plasterer would be coming to school to take her home. And no, Doris would not be riding along. Arlene didn't know Bill and was considerably leery. But she did know the Criders, and she trusted them. So she reluctantly agreed. Bill did pick her up that day and drive her home. Though, as Bill would later tell the story, Arlene wasn't particularly eager to talk. She kept the radio turned up too loud for there to be much conversation. Not deterred, Bill continued his pursuit of her, and soon she was enjoying the pursuit. A romance started to flourish, but in December of 1954, Bill and six of his friends joined the Air Force. By then, he knew she was hooked. As he declared, she's in love with me and she'll wait. And she did. Bill became a flight engineer in the Air Force, but for the next several years while he was stationed in Germany, 
letters flew back and forth across the Atlantic every day. On a personal note, speaking about those letters, Anne Arlene was writing these letters from her home, the farm where she grew up. I was young, but I remember one evening when we visited my grandparents and there were no other cousins there. Normally when we would go, there would be cousins and I'd play with the cousins. When it happened that there were no cousins there, Aunt Arlene would typically spend some time with us. She would play card games or teach us board games. I think I learned to play Chinese checkers from her, I'm not sure. But I remember this, this particular night, Arlene was busy writing one of her letters to Bill. And there was no way my sister Mary and I were going to get any of her time until that letter was finished. Right out of high school in 1954, Arlene started working at Fogelsonger's Insurance. Bill and Arlene had both been born near the end of the Great Depression and had both learned to be quite frugal. Since Arlene was still living at home, she was able to save nearly every penny she earned. While stationed in Germany, Bill's buddies would spend their pay on cigarettes and alcohol. Bill, on the other hand, would save all his pay and send it home to be banked. In 1957, Bill had a month of leave. After flying back to the States, they decided to get married during his month home. In 15 days, they made that, 15 days after they made that decision, they had their wedding. 15 days. A friend of Arlene's had recently been married, and her bridesmaid dresses were loaned to Arlene's bridesmaids. Only the bride's dress was new. Her dad, my grandpa, was sick in bed, so her brother Elmore walked her down the aisle. And so it was that on the 31st of August, 1957, before 200 guests, Bill and Arlene Plasterer took a vow that they would keep until death do us part. Their wedding, presided over by Reverend Roland Garvin, was the last wedding in the old Otterbein Church near Newburgh before it was torn down and that congregation moved to their new facility just across the road. Bill and Arlene went on a honeymoon to Virginia Beach and then too soon Bill had to return to Germany. Arlene returned home to the farm and the letters would continue for the next 16 months. With only a few months to go, Bill was transferred to Columbia, Indiana. He would be discharged on December the 1st, 1958. After four years of letter writing, with a little bit of leave and a wedding tossed into the middle, Bill and Arlene were finally able to be together. They officially took up housekeeping, living in the large farmhouse with her parents. Bill went back to work at Kressler's and maintained a side job of helping Grandpa Mara on the farm. But since Bill and Arlene both worked in town, it made sense that they looked for a place closer to their jobs. Some, <clears throat> excuse me, some land along Route 11, just a few miles south of Shippensburg, was available, and they determined they'd build a new house. While they hired a general contractor who had other vendors and tradesmen working on its construction, Bill did as much of the work as he could. It was August 1959, just nine months after Bill's discharge, that their house was completed and they moved into their new home on the Molly Pitcher Highway. Because of the money they had saved over the years, they were left with a whopping mortgage payment of $75.95 a month. Less than a year after they had moved in, they had an announcement. It was one of those announcements that would be another nine months in the making. And so it was that on February the 15th, 1961, they were blessed to announce the birth of a son, Keith. Three years later, on what would be my brother Rodney's birthday, May 14th, Kevin would be born. And finally, on January the 30th, 1966, Mark would complete their family. By now, Bill was working for the Pennsylvania Electric Company. Eventually, he would be promoted to chief lineman. He was always a conscientious employee. He always wanted to be available when he was on call because the one call that he never wanted to miss was the one that might help somebody who was without power get their power back on. If you knew my Uncle Bill at all, you knew he loved to tell the stories of his life or his job. I remember one such story from his work days. He was called out on a Saturday afternoon to a transformer problem. Upon investigation, it was discovered that an Amish family had just bought and signed for a farm that day, and not wanting to have nor pay for the electricity, the farmer had taken a chisel and hammered it right through the incoming wire directly below his electric meter. Fortunately, he wasn't electrocuted. Up to this point, the plasterers had been an active part of Otterbein Church in, on the Newburgh Charge, but as the boys were growing and getting involved in more activities, they opted to look closer to home. It wasn't a very long search for them to settle on this church right here, Messiah, in Chippensburg. 
They would sink their roots deep here. Friendships were built. Bill would serve for a season as Sunday school superintendent. Arlene would sing in the choir and play the piano for 28 years. My wife, Chris, grew up in this church. The first time I visited here as a friend of hers, I noticed my aunt and uncle and cousins just a few pews away sitting right over there. Uncle Bill was sure to go out of his way to welcome me. Now, I don't know if he did this to Chris every Sunday after that because I didn't keep coming to church with her every Sunday. I still had my own church. But every Sunday, uh, every time he saw me after that, he would say, how's Chris doing? And I can just picture him bugging Chris every Sunday saying, how's Wayne doing? How's Wayne doing? Do you remember back in the days when you would hardly ever lock your car? Maybe if you parked it somewhere and you had something significant in it, you would park it. But one evening, um, Chris and I were out driving. We were here in Shippensburg. We were waiting at a stoplight. Cars had bench seats back then. You can, you're, some of you are old enough to remember bench seats. Chris had slid all the way over right next to me. And suddenly the driver's door popped open. And there was Uncle Bill's face. The smile on his face belied the serious tone as he warned, you kids behave yourselves. Despite having three boys under age 10 in their home, Uncle Bill and Aunt Arlene would invite Chris and I to spend several of our date nights at their home playing cards. There would be ample snacks and soda as us guys were pitted against the gals playing double deck pinochle. While he may have invited us and visited with us and played and did things with many other adults, his boys were never ignored. Bill invested himself in teaching them many of the same lessons that he had learned. There would be hunting and fishing. There would be games and sports. There would be chores and paper routes. There would be lessons in gardening and canning. There would be mowing and trimming and pruning bushes. There would be school and scouts and church. Not only did Bill teach them what he knew, but he imparted character to them as well. You help others. It's just what you do. You don't just mow your own lawn. You mow several of the neighbor's lawns as well. The boys worked hard to excel, not because Bill had given it to them as a mandate, but because they just wanted to please him. You remember how I told you Bill was real frugal when he was in the military? Well, it wasn't lost on his sons that their home never had central air conditioning until after they had all moved out. (laughs) And just because it's summer and the car has air conditioning in it doesn't mean you need to use it. You put the windows down. Running your car's air conditioning compressor uses more gasoline. In 1970, the family rented George Mons' camper. They, the family was hooked on camping right from the start. Bill's mom had been a lead player in Cub Scouting in the area, so it was only natural for the boys to get into scouting. Camping gave Keith the opportunity to use some of his budding Cub Scouting skills. Kevin and Mark would follow suit. One of Uncle Bill's camping traditions was to fire up the charcoal grill and do chicken every Sunday before breaking camp and going home. Bill was always involved in what the boys were involved with. Once Keith had advanced to the Boy Scout level, Bill got involved with scouts too. Bob Reed was the scoutmaster of Troop 121. Bob welcomed Bill on board. He served as the troop treasurer. He became the merit badge counselor, twice traveling with the boys to Philmont Scout Camp in New Mexico. Bill made a lasting impression on many people and the scouts from Troop 121 were no exception. Several of them had posted on the website for uh, the funeral home, uh, the Bricker, the Focus Song of Bricker Funeral Home, these words. One of them said, Bill was one of the great troop dads, always willing to give us a hand. Another one said, Bill was a huge part of enabling us scouts to have a fantastic experience. Not only did his support directly impact the lives of the troop, but through me, It is now cascaded down to the next generation of scouts. So indirectly, Bill changed the lives of kids and is changing the lives of kids kids that he never knew. How amazing is that? Bill had been a great dad, but he was equally as committed to love and encourage the next generation of grandchildren and even great-grandchildren as well. Bill and Arlene were always available to help family and others and to serve by example. Their grandson Isaac shared that a couple Thanksgivings ago they had no sooner finished eating Then Bill was up starting to clear the table and doing dishes. Isaac asked him, Poppy, why are you always getting up and doing this? And Bill's response was, well, somebody needs to do it, and it might as well be me. How's that for modeling servant leadership? Other grandchildren commented on the memories of not just being together with their Poppy, but working together, picking blueberries and apples, making applesauce. No matter how busy Bill was, there would always be time for Arlene. I asked the boys 
What was his favorite? What was his favorite hobby? I mean, he had a lot of things that he was involved. In. What was his favorite hobby? And they pointed to Arlene, and they said, "Mother." Mother was his favorite hobby. Whether it was helping clean, do dishes, hang laundry, work in the garden, cook or can, anything that involved her was his favorite. He wanted to be good to her and do whatever she wanted. Well, apparently, she wanted to square dance. In the mid-1970s, they were invited by their friends, Arthur and Hazel Breckbill, to square dance. They had known the Breckbills as fellow campers in the Good Sam Club. After saying yes to square dancing, Bill and Arlene discovered that to get your first degree in square dancing required 75 lessons. 75, and that's just the first degree. A new square dancing club was being formed called the Ship and Squares. Bill and Arlene would become Charter Lifetime members when it was organized in 1977. They would become quite good at square dancing, and square dancing would be quite good to them. Square dancing would take them to or through every state in America twice and they started through them a third time as they were participating in 44 national square dancing conventions. Now, if that's all that Bill did, just the things that I've already said, if those things listed above were the end of his involvement, it would be significant, very impressive. But hang on, because Bill was also a member of the American Legion Post 223, a member of the Durf Kuhn Post 6168 of the VFW, a lifetime member of the Vigilant Hose Company. He served as the president of the Penn Dixie Square Campers Chapter 45 of Chambersburg. He was the president of the Good Sam Club Chapter 25 of Chambersburg. He served as the state secretary of the PA Square and Round Dance Federation. He played the role of Santa Claus at school and other events. Is your head spinning yet? That's just the start. He was also chair of the NSDCA State Camporee. He was the treasurer of the Mount Rock Water Cooperative. He was a member of the Fort Morris Chapter 3324 of the Fort Morris Double AARP. He served as a school board director in Shippensburg for 12 years. He was on the Shippensburg Park and Recreation Commission. He worked with Bible Release Time. He served with the Southampton Franklin County School Authority. After retiring from Penelec, he was a substitute bus driver for Macbeth, Musick, Macbeth Bussing. Is it any wonder that Bill knew so many people, that he touched so many lives? He had rubbed shoulders with people all over this area in all sorts of capacities. Several of their friends had taken their campers and started wintering in Florida. And when Bill retired from Penelec, Arlene conjectured that perhaps if she would retire also, this wintering in Florida idea might work out. They loved it so much it became their norm. Just a few years ago, their Florida trip was cut short by a water leak in their home that required significant renovation. That was bad, but it can't rival the reason that this year's trip was cut short a diagnosis of advancing cancer. They came home quickly, and shortly after arriving home, Bill was placed into hospice care. These last weeks have been challenging for Arlene and for the family and those who've known and loved Bill. There are new challenges that yet await, but God is gracious. His love is everlasting. His presence is real. I was blessed in talking to the family that in Uncle Bill's last few hours, he several, time, he several times used the strength of his last breaths to say, I love the Lord. I love the Lord. He not only did love the Lord, but he's now in the Lord's presence where he's able to tell the Lord that in person. I'm going to ask Dr. Fran Norton if he would come and to share. And as he's coming, I would like to point out to you that the last thing in your program today at the bottom is the... Uh, funeral homes web address where you can leave comments or your reflections about Bill and his life. Fran? I don't have the history that Wayne had, but I had over 50 years. I came from Michigan back in 69 and started teaching at the university and did what most people that are transplanted, did some church shopping and moved around and ended up here at Messiah with Ted Yo, and got involved in what was going on at the church. At that time, I had an opportunity to meet Bill because he was an usher. And back during that time, we wore coats and ties to usher and we ushered people to their seats. And it was not unusual for us to take the arm of the lady 
and to walk them down the aisle while the gentleman followed behind to the aisle that we were going to. Bill was an active member at Messiah United Methodist. When I was elected to the administrative board, which met down in Fellowship Hall, I noticed that Bill was on the same side of the room that I was on, and that's because the men were on one side and the women were on the other side. And he, we're in a U table. But when I saw Bill there, I said, okay, what can I expect here? And he said, Fran, just have an open mind. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, well, a lot of things can happen and a lot of things will take a lot of time. But one of the things that you need to know is listen first before you say anything. He was also a part of our Good Samaritan class and also the Disciple Bible Study class when they weren't in Florida. When they left, it left a hole in our class. But when they come back, we had to check in and find out everything that went on down in Florida to know what was happening. And we enjoyed, enjoyed that time with them. When the boys got old enough to be in youth fellowship, I was involved in that and my daughters were also and we had ourselves some great times at Dublin Gap and also at Rehoboth Beach. One of the things that I could count on if I needed a bus driver was Bill. I would come to him and say, any chance of you driving the bus to Rehoboth or to Dublin Gap or wherever? And he would say, well, I guess are the boy's going. And I said, I don't know. I haven't asked them yet because we're just talking about it. And he said, the boys are going, I'm gonna go. But the thing that I remember most vividly about Bill is when he was at Penelope, we lived at the end of the block on Brenton and we had a transformer up there that the squirrels liked to go to. We had fried squirrel underneath our transformer, I don't know how many times. But I remember one time when we called Penelac and said, our power's out, what do we do? Talk to Bill and he said, I don't have anybody with me, but let me call. He showed up with a secretary. <laughs> and I said, is she gonna go up there too? And he said, nope, I'll take care of it. And he said, we're done messing around with this guy. We're gonna put in a new transformer. We're gonna put in a shield and they're not gonna be around anymore. When he finished all this, I looked at him and I said, Bill, thanks so much. It saved our freezer from everything thawing out. But he looked at me and he said, you know, that's not a problem. You know, I enjoy doing this. And so we stood there and talked for a while. But one of the things that I loved about Bill was his faith in Jesus Christ. He believed in him throughout his life. Even though there were difficult times, he knew that that presence was always there and that he could count on him 100%. He knew that Jesus was walking by, him, by his side. A few weeks ago, we had a prayer blanket, prayed over here at church, and then on Sunday morning, and I lost which Sunday it was, Arlene, I took it out to the house, and he was back in the bedroom and laying on the bed, and I took the blanket out and laid it over the top of him, and he opened one eye, and he looked prayed with him. His faith was strong. And you heard that from what Wayne, Wayne had talked about. And I knew that I could count on that every way. And when he helped me with YF, he was a blessing because he was there for the retreats. Sometimes he would stick around even though he drove the bus. And so he was a blessing to us, Arlene. Thank you for sharing Bill with us through all of this. And boys, it was great having Dad with us. We turn now to the next generation, and that would be starting with Keith. Well, it was a privilege and an honor to uh, be at the in the line back there and have everybody here today. I, I'm, I'm just humbled and uh, thank you. Um, you're, you're a testament to my dad's uh, 
legacy and uh, just thankful thankful for everybody and uh, you know there's there's people here that traveled long distances and family and friends but people from Penn Elect, people from all all realms a lot of a lot of camping friends and again just thanks for being here and sharing this day with us it was only just yesterday we were down in Sarasota and the uh, we were down there for a little bit of time and my parents were already down and they wanted to come over and visit us and we were sitting there they drove to almost an hour and a half to come visit us and when they were there my dad was sitting and we were chatting for a while and he says I think maybe next year will be our last year to go to Florida so he wasn't ready to give up yet and um, so it wasn't long ago just a couple of days actually ago and uh, it was one evening I happened to be there and you know I asked him you know he tells stories to everybody so I happened to ask him about how he came to know the Lord and you know he he uh, he clammed up a little bit he his eyes watered and in a, in a lower toned voice I was holding his hand and he says is it really that time is it really that time right and then you know he said I love the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior and so I was very happy to 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 be knowing where he is today and I knew all I knew my whole life but it was just great to hear him say it and um, so I was sitting down to reflect on my father I was thinking what am I gonna say you know what am I gonna talk about and you know what did my, what did my dad teach me what did, what did my what, what, what about my dad? And I, I think the best thing I can say is he, he led by example. He led by example. Um, he, was all, he was always consistent. He was always steadfast. He was always true. You could count. You could count on my dad. Uh, he attacked every situation head on. He never put off for tomorrow what he could accomplish today. He, he somehow found a balance in life, which was sometimes hard to do with uh, serving his family, serving his church, and serving his community. I remember having conversations, you know, in high school with, with him when he served on the school board about some of the things that were going on, and it's like, you know, so we, we, we had some good banter along the way. Um, if, if you were doing something with my dad, you better be ready to do it. So a lot of times he helped out at the house all the time, and, uh, one of the things he would do is he would either help cook or he would help do the dishes. But if he, if he was doing the dishes, which was more often than not, um, us boys got elected to be the dryers. And uh, so as we were drying, you better be keeping up, right? So, that, so it's like you better be having him dr dry this dish and put it in the cupboard by the time the next one hits the sink. So we were, we were solid as a rock. We, we knew how to, to, to do work growing up. Um, he always challenged us to do our best. He didn't do it in our face, but it was, again, by example. So uh, he taught us to work hard, and Wayne did the most excellent job earlier, all the different things that uh, we did, but um, hard work was, was one of them. Now, my cousins are here, and I, I've, I've, joked, I've joked with Wayne when we were talking to him. It's like, well, I would tell you we did hard work growing up, but I didn't live on a farm. And I said, you guys know what hard work is. So um, anyway, um, my dad seemed to know everybody because he liked to talk to everybody. And he would be routinely introducing us to somebody that we didn't know, and it's like, who are these people, you know? Or we'd get to the campground and, um, you know, after about a couple hours, you know, this couple would be coming over, somebody else would be coming over, and it's like, they were, they were like longtime friends, but they had just met. So one little story I'll tell you. Um, one day when I was in high school, I was a little late to work, and uh, I don't know why I was taking my dad's truck and not my vehicle, um, but 
I took the truck and it was, it was a Ford F-150. It was the burnt orange one, if anybody remembers it. And it had the full size eight horsepower engine and that thing would go. So anyway, so I'm, I'm going down the road um, and next thing I know, and I knew where to slow down if I needed to, but apparently I didn't this day and the siren goes on behind me and I, uh, I thought, oh, geez. So the, the, I, the officer comes up and he says, looks at me, and he said, didn't you have your ears on? I'm, I'm like, oh, what's that? And then it hit me, you know, they had the CB in the truck, and I, I didn't have my ears on. So uh, anyway, so the officers took my license in the owner's car and goes back, and he sits back there. You know, they, they like to take their time at that point. So I'm like stewing, like I'm going to really be late now. And so he finally comes back up and he says, well, this might be your lucky day, but I'm going to let you off. And I, uh, I was probably going a little more than I should have been at that time. And I uh, won't say what that was, but uh, so he says, I'm going to let you off under one condition. And the condition was, I had to go home within the next day and tell my dad how fast I was going. And so part of me was like, I was pretty happy, right, until that part came. And then, and the, the, the story is about my dad and not about me, because my wife says, this isn't supposed to be about you, Keith, right? So, uh, anyway, so he, the officer said, I had just stopped and pulled over, and I know your dad really well. He was mowing the grass, and I had talked to him for a while. And so my dad knew everybody, right? And he apparently knew somebody that didn't, that, uh, that was a policeman. And so hindsight, maybe I should have taken the ticket because my, <laughs> my, my dad was a very good disciplinarian. And uh, so as Wayne had said earlier, one thing that was ever present in our, in our house that it was, my, for my whole life, there was not a time I didn't remember this, is that my dad loved my mother. And so I, I decided I was gonna be brief today, but when my dad, when they would come visit and they'd be ready to leave, he would always say, Arlene, it's time for us to get up the road. And I, I'll leave you with, I believe my dad's in a better place. Uh, up the road with his savior. Thank you. I have some remarks from both Kevin and Mark. Kevin has written, he was a father that was always there for you or for anyone else that needed help. Our dad was always willing to help other people. While we were growing up, he taught us that to always help others meant mowing grass for neighbors, trimming shrubbery for Uncle Harold and Aunt Peggy every year. He was always cheerful, and he never complained. Our Father taught you to respect others the same way you would like to be treated. For the last three years, I was able to drive my parents to and from Florida. The road trips were full of stories, most of which I'd heard multiple times, but I didn't mind. In our family, whenever you tell the same story the second time, my family will go like this. That's twice. <laughs> or three times. And I have a few stories, I'm sure Uncle Bill did too, that would be like this if you were actually keeping track of them. Dad always knew what routes to take, what exit Flying J truck stops were at, and he always knew where Cracker Barrel restaurants were. Our father enjoyed working for Penelec. He always said he had great people working with him. When we went hunting in Judiana County, he would always tell us stories of emergency repairs they did in those areas, or just stories about his Penelec days while driving to and from our hunting spot. Kevin said that he didn't remember getting in any serious trouble with Daddy, unlike the story we just heard about the speeder over here. <clears throat> but he says, if my memory serves me well, I was always the good son. <laughs> always on time when the two others were late, and Kevin was always, where he got, he was always where he was supposed to be on time whenever nobody else seemed to be. Mark wrote, I'd like to thank all of you for being here today and celebrating our dad in this transition to his next life with his Lord and Savior. I can hear him saying now, I don't know how I can repay all of you for coming today. Many of you may know that dad never drank or smoked, and growing up, I can't even remember him swearing. 
When something bad happened, his go-to bad word was typically fiddlesticks. He also had a saying, if you're waiting on me, you're late. Some may be scratching their heads and saying, what does that mean? Well, I quickly learned that it meant that he was always prompt or early to where he needed to be, and that if you were waiting on him, you were likely late because he was already on his way or already there. Dad was also a storyteller. He could sit down with anyone and rattle off many different stories in no time. Some of my favorite stories of Dad were hit from his time in the military, his employment at Kressler's, and his many years at Penelec. I'm sure we would have had enough material to write a book if we'd recorded all those stories. Over the years, Dad was always by my mother's side. Whether it's for cutting up vegetables for hog mall, helping her with canning, or the prep work for making pies, anything, he was always there. He always helped prepare the garden for planting, planting the garden, tending to the garden, and helping enter all the items in the fair for Mother to take home all the ribbons. So the way that story sounds to me is he did a lot of the work for her to get the ribbons and the credit for those things. Makes me wonder about some of the food that came to the reunion, who actually did that cooking, but we won't go there. Dad was always there for his family and friends. He would go out of his way to find something that we needed. He enjoyed going to his grandchildren's sporting events, or he'd just randomly pick up the phone and call to see how we were doing. I often find myself emulating his life lessons by chatting with neighbors, opening a door for someone, snow blowing the neighbor's driveway, pairing the apples for my wife to make apple pies during the holidays, or simply being there for a friend. Over the past few years, one of my great joys has been watching my son spend time with dad and mom and learn new things, like making applesauce or just a random chat around the fire while camping. Family was always the most important thing to dad. He loved his family completely and was so proud of us. Watching him teach my son our family traditions, leading by example about how to be a good man, spending time with him and being involved in the things that are important to him mean the world to me, and I will forever be grateful to him. I'm looking forward to honoring him, celebrating his legacy, and passing on stories about him and lessons he has taught us all, and to see a part of him and his grandchildren and great-grandchildren as they grow. His spirit will shine within all of us. Until we meet again, I love you, Dad. We move to the next generation, and we call on Elijah. A little nervous. Give me a second. <clears throat> um, as I was sitting down to write what I wanted to say, I started to think of some of the words that kind of define who Poppy was to me. Um, he was loyal, hardworking, giving, God-fearing, and loving. I'm assuming that everyone sitting here today could agree that everything I just said about Poppy is a good example. Um, he really is just a, an example of being a hard worker, Loyal, protective, providing husband, good listener, friend, and an amazing dad, grandfather, and great-grandfather. Poppy was consistent. He was there for everything he could possibly be for, for his kids and his grandkids. I know I speak for my siblings and cousins when I say that he was there for, or missed very few sporting events, um, choir, anything like that. When I say this, well, let me start over here. He loved teaching us all and making applesauce, chicken corn soup, along with many other things. His love for his family was evident through his actions. A love that we can all look up to is a love that Poppy consistently showed for Grandma. And that's the type of love I strive to show to my own wife. As you could probably see in the pictures above us here this morning, he was always loving on her, and you could always tell that he was proud he was his girl. The impact that Poppy made on not only his family and his entire community is evident. We look around, there are people that Poppy touched in one way or another in each season of his life. The evidence is here in this room today. I know that Poppy was involved in a lot of boards and committees, but when I actually found out when I read through the obituary, it's amazing how much he did. Amazing. It's truly astonishing how someone could have such an impact and yet stay so humble. Poppy is easy to honor because he is such an amazing man. And although today feels sad to all of us, and sad to all of us, we can acknowledge what a hole is now left in the family. 
we're able to see and be thankful that Poppy now is pain-free in heaven with our Savior. I picture Poppy right now in heaven with new knees, playing holy washers, dancing, drinking Coke. And I have to wonder if he greeted Jesus with a, hey, they're good looking. And just comments from two other grandchildren. This from granddaughter Lauren Plaster or Wilder. There are a few memories that come to mind, the strongest memory being camping. Whether it was breakfast, dinner, or mountain pie time, you could always find Poppy behind the griddle, cooking bacon, cooking potatoes on the skillet, or cooking over the fire. In between meals, you could find Poppy strolling around the neighboring campsites, making friends, or simply just chatting. He would say hello to anyone, or hey there, good looking, that you just made, he just made you smile. Stranger danger was definitely not a worry of his. I've never met anyone so eager to just talk, whether it was a story about life experience or a comment about the weather. A few other memories include working in Poppy and Grandma's garden, which taught us hard work and responsibility, seeing him at church every Sunday, meeting at the treat before school for donuts, going for a walk and a run, and seeing him on the sidelines of my softball games or in the bleachers at my basketball games, giving me a thumbs up. And from grandson Kyle Plasterer, a couple of memories that stick out to me are getting breakfast at the Path Valley restaurant on the first day of hunting season with Dad and Poppy. I like my bacon, just like Poppy, extra crispy. Some goes with e cooking and eating family breakfast when we were, or same goes with e cooking and eating family breakfast when we were camping, especially at Prince Gallitzin. I was usually last to wake up, but Poppy would always be up helping cook, clean, or walking around the campground, popping in for a visit at everyone else's site to talk. I never met someone more willing to talk to anybody to have a genuine conversation. And some of my favorite times as a kid were camping with Poppy and Grandma and the rest of our family. Raising potatoes in their garden in the summertime, one of the many times learning about hard work from you and Poppy as a kid. Poppy would take me for donuts at the treat when I was in elementary and middle school before the school day would even start. He could tell you how to get anywhere in the country off the top of his head. You're going to take this road until you get there, and then you'll hop on this road, and you'll take it just so far, and, and so on. I am sure that every person gathered here today has a memory of Bill. If you didn't, you wouldn't be here. You're here because he touched your life in one way or another. And I would encourage you to be sure to tell those stories. Tell those stories, your stories, to family Tell them, you, you, many people say, well, I don't know what I'd say. I, I can't really put it into words. I'm afraid I'll cry. I'm afraid I'll make them cry. I, I'll tell you what, they would rather hear that you remembered and make it bring a tear to their eye than to let that story go untold. So make sure you tell your story in one way or another as we continue to remember Bill in the days, months, and years ahead. Would you pray with me? Gracious Lord, I am so thankful for my Uncle Bill Plaster. I thank you for the way he influenced and shaped not only his family, but his extended family. Thank you for the way he blessed every one of us at family reunions. The way he reached out and included us and wanted to know about us and how we were doing and what things were going on in our lives. Lord, those things are just special and those memories are very close. But Lord, I thank you for the influences that shaped his life and made him be the man that he was. I thank you for his grandparents and parents, for his aunts and uncles and his siblings. I thank you for his pastors and his teachers, for his school teachers, his Sunday school teachers, for those who uh, took time to train and teach him the lessons of life that became so much a part of who he was. Lord, we celebrate every one of those. And we thank you, Lord, for the challenge that you've given us as we've been influenced and touched by Bill's life to continue to share the good news of your love, to continue to encourage and bless others, to be helpful, to be kind, to be truly interested in, in the concerns and affairs of other people. Lord, may we emulate him in all those ways as we continue to celebrate his life and his memory. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Grandson Isaac is going to come and share a passage of Scripture from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18.
Yeah, sorry, I'm there. We, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with a voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we after that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Our hymn is number 369. If you are able, I invite you to stand with me as we sing. Scripture that will be the basis of a brief meditation, Dr. Fran Norton once again, from Romans chapter 8. Listen to Paul's words to the church at Rome. What then shall we say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him graciously give up all things. Who will bring any change against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Jesus Christ who died. More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword 
as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are considered a sheep who will be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor demons, neither present nor future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of our Lord. God is for us. That's how this passage starts. God is for us. It might not seem like it at times when you're going through these kinds of moments. It might seem like God is very, very far away. It might seem like God's left you alone. It might seem like because somebody that's dearly loved is gone that you've been abandoned. But the reality is that our God is still with us. He is for us. And if God is for us, who can be against us? The fact that God is for us was evidenced in the fact that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. The fact that God is for us is evidenced in the reality that those who call upon him will be saved. The fact that God is for us is evidenced in the reality that there's no place that we can go on planet Earth that we can be separated from this wonderful God who loves us so much. He who did not spare his own son. He who did not spare his own son. Every time a Hebrew laid his hands on the head of that ram or lamb or goat, to be the sacrifice for their sins, it was at best a promissory note of the most precious blood of Jesus Christ, who when one day John the Baptist would look and say concerning this man Jesus, the Son of God, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This one who came into the world to die in our place, to die for our sin, he was there because God didn't spare his own son. He gave him freely and willingly as a demonstration of his love for each of us. The next verse, verse 33, says God justifies us. To be justified means that in Christ I am made clean before the Lord. When I am in Christ, my sins are washed away. Though they were as scarlet, they will be as white as snow, the scripture says. We are made clean because of Christ. Verse 34, we're not condemned because of Jesus, this Jesus who died for us who was raised for us, and who intercedes for us. While it may seem in these moments like we're abandoned or we're alone or where's dad, where's my husband, where's grandpa, poppy, where are the people, where's this person that I had counted on for so much in my life? While it may seem like we're abandoned, keep in mind that Bill is in the presence of the one who is interceding even now for us. Jesus himself is interceding on our behalf that we might experience God's grace, encounter his love, and walk daily with him. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation, distress, and all these things that Fran read from these passages of Scripture, there is absolutely nothing that can separate us. The Scripture goes on to say that uh, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. A lot of us have enough troubles and struggles in life. We just like to be conquerors every now and then. But Paul says we're we're not just low-life conquerors every now and then. We are more than conquerors. I, I don't know what it means to be truly more than a conqueror in life, to be victorious in all circumstances, to realize that no matter how pressing and difficult and challenging life may be, there is that hope and promise from God that we are winners and victors because of Jesus Christ. This passage concludes with the words, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. I want to clarify that us for just a moment. It's easy to take a word of scripture like that and say, well, that applies to the whole world. But let's remember who Paul was writing to. Paul, as he writes this letter to the church at Rome, was writing to believers. He was writing to Christians. He was writing to people who knew Jesus Christ as their Savior. And he says about this group of people, nothing can separate us from God's love. You see, for those who don't know Christ as their Savior, there is something that can ultimately separate you from God's love, and that's death and the judgment that follows whenever a person is consigned to hell. 
But there's nothing in all creation that can separate us, those who know Christ, from God's love. And so I would just like to conclude this day with this thought. Are you in Christ? Do you know Him as your Savior? Are you one of those for whom you can look even at the passing of somebody that you knew and loved and with a, a understanding of being more than a conqueror, look that right in the eye and say, God wins. He won for Bill and he will win for me too. God wins. I am a conqueror because of Jesus, the one who is with us, that is never separated from us, from those who are in Christ Jesus. Even death can't do it. Even death can't separate us from God. God's love is with us today, my friends, and we need to respond to that love with an understanding that He cares more deeply about us than we will ever know in this lifetime. He loves us. He cares for us. And He wants us to walk with Him in the victorious love that He's given us, sharing that love with our world, demonstrating that love to other people, the kind of love that Bill gave away all the time to dozens, hundreds of people. We need to have that love manifested in our hearts and lives and flowing from us out into a world that is hungry to hear. That in the midst of loss, in the midst of family crises, in the midst of friends gone, we still have a Savior who loves us, keeps us, and holds us in the palm of His hand. If you're here today and for any reason you'd like further conversation about what it means to be one of those us's that we're talking about, to be in Christ, I'd love to have that conversation with you as would Fran or others. would be delighted to introduce you to this one Jesus. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you that Bill was in Christ. And I thank you that Christ Lord Jesus, you were in Bill. Christ in you, the hope of glory, the Scripture says. Thank you that you were in Bill. And thank you, Lord, that Bill is in you, even now, in a more complete way than we yet know, but in a way that we long for one day. I pray, O oh Father, that you will give us the grace to keep responding to your love, the love you gave us that was demonstrated to us when you died on the cross. We praise you, O Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And for the last time, I'm going to say it today. If you are able, would you please stand as we share in our closing hymn. 377, It Is Well With My Soul.
more to the cemetery, I would like to just share with you, for any of you who will not be going to the cemetery, you're invited to go to the Fellowship Hall where beverages will already be available. Uh, and the family and others who will be going to the cemetery will be returning from there as soon as we can to fellowship and to share together more reflections and table fellowship and talk and conversation and the kinds of things that help bring healing to our hearts as we share in the loss and share in the grief together. May you go forth from this place knowing that God loves you, knowing that he cares for you, knowing that he's given each of us opportunity to respond to his grace. May we respond with all our hearts and allow his presence to fill our lives. Amen. You may be seated and please remain so until given further instruction by the staff of the funeral home. procession with us to please use your headlights in your four ways um, gentlemen serving as pallbearers will need you at the back of the church and again at the grave site we're just going to do an organized uh, dismissal uh, work our way up to the front and we'll go ahead and start that now <laughs> 